remember that. Happen, <coughs> that we recognize them as an invasive species. But the thing with mutons is we don't remember that vision because it happened before most of us were born. <coughs> they were brought over or 100 years ago to the US because they were really beautiful birds. They were brought as ornamental pets for park zoos and estates because they are such a gorgeous bird. I always first admit they are beautiful, even if they are invasive. And so uh, what happens all too often with an introduced species is that they escaped and they started breeding out in the wild. And unfortunately with the swans, they started breeding out more like a lot. They're really good at it. So with the invasive species, that's not always the best thing. So specifically in Michigan, the first wild pair was spotted in Charlottesville County back in 1919, which is in the uh, northern lower peninsula. Um, it's been estimated in the Great Lakes area that they have a growth rate of 10 to 18 percent a year. And so any of you that study population growth rates like quite high. It's, it's really good growing for you know a large species like this. And so it's um, as you look through the historical data, um, so this just pulled off a eBird, you can see uh, youth swans, all the purple is uh, youth swan sightings. You can see that not only is there a large population on the east coast, but you can see Michigan, the Great Lakes area really has a lot of youth swans there. And it resulted in the fact of Five years ago, mute swans had a population estimated over 15,000 individual birds, which made it the largest population, statewide population of mute swans anywhere in the US. So not a great distinction to have for a native species. Uh, there's also uh, invasions over in uh, the Pacific Coast down in California, also up by Vancouver and Seattle. And then also uh, the smaller invasions over in Australia and New Zealand, and then also in Japan too. Definitely not as much as what we have in the Great Lakes area, but they do have some issues <coughs> with them, so they're having to manage those invasions. So some other issues with mute swans, along with them being uh, a species that there's just a lot of numbers of them out there, there's also some other issues along with the numbers. Uh, they're one of the largest flying waterfowl in the world. Uh, the trumpeter swan is on average considered the largest flying waterfowl in the world. Mute swans are right up there with them. Uh, an individual mute swan actually was reported as the largest flying waterfowl in the world. So these are some pretty big guys. Um, just for pure numbers, they average about 10 kilograms uh, per weight. And any of you who know a bird, that's a pretty hefty bird. And then they have a wingspan averaging about 220 centimeters. So to kind of put it in perspective, uh, mute swans, since I know someone who does great lakes piping plover work, one mute swan equals the entire breeding population of Great Lakes piping plovers. It's also equal to about um, three milk jugs. So just imagine the weight of three milk jugs coming at you. That's about what you could expect with mute swan. As far as their size, imagine LeBron James with his arms spread out. That's about how big of a wingspan mute swans have. And I think most of you guys can imagine. So it's about seven feet of a wingspan. In addition to uh, being large, they're also known for aggression. And I really apologize, Natalie Portman, but when you do a movie about Swan Lake, you know I have to somehow corrupt it for a talk. So, um, mute swans usually are seen as these really beautiful, gorgeous, graceful birds, but they also kind of have this darker side. And then for those of you who have been attacked by a mute swan, you swear they look like this when they're coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> I know the one that attacked me, it had the eyes like that. Um, but no, this is usually what they end up looking like. This is their very common threat display. And if you see this, you do not want to be standing there much longer. You want to start backing away as quickly as you can from that situation. Because they will harass, injure, and kill other waterfowl. They will also harass, injure, and kill people. So they have been reported that you're able to break people's bones. They have brown, grown men. They like to take uh, grad students around on their kayaks and dive bomb them. So, okay, that's that. Mm -hmm. By the way, don't ever laugh at these swans because that's when they'll come by a bomb at you. Um, but you can see, I don't know how well you guys can make it out in the back, but this is the mute swan that actually did attack me. And you, if you look very closely, you can see he's all puffed up just like that previous image I showed. So when you see that, you definitely do not want to be around very long because they will come after you. There is some argument if they are more or less aggressive than the uh, native trumpeter swan. There hasn't been anything that I found in the literature that says one way or the other if they are. But when I talk to other uh, ornithologists that study both the mute swan and the trumpeter swan, they tend to say that the mute swan is the more aggressive of the two species. So, so any future research projects out there that you guys want to do, go and find out for sure which is more aggressive. But the biggest issue with mute swans is their really big appetite. They like to eat, and they like to eat a lot. And their preferred uh, food is similar to aquatic vegetation, or SAP, or SAP. Um, mute swans, they 
the uh, shoot densities, but also the height of the FAV. And they also documented that where there was these large non-breeding flocks of mute swans, that they could completely wipe out a vegetation of all the SAV, or wipe out a wetland of all the vegetation or the SAV that's there. So just imagine swans like coming through like a lawnmower and just taking everything right out. That's what they were doing. So why do we care about that SAV or those weeds in the lake? For those of you who like to go out boating and fishing, most of the time you're cursing it because it gets caught up in your props, or if you're pulling in your grass carp, you know, I mean, how many times have we pulled that in when we're fishing? You're like, dang it, I thought I had a fish, and no, it's just that big piece of yellow grass. But SAV is critically important to wetlands. Uh, things like oxygen, where you have more robust SAV beds, you're going to have more oxygen. The uh, animals and species that live in there, those fish and invertebrates, they need that oxygen. It also helps to reduce, reduce the wave action of the solar intensity in there. So think of an SAV bed as a forest under the water. So just like <coughs> a forest is going to provide protection and food for deer and other organisms, same thing with the SAV beds for the fish and birds that live there. And these are important because where you have those robust SAV beds, you're going to have fish that are able to increase their survival rates because they're not having to spend so much energy on just surviving or doing uh, the foraging time to be able to get um, food, they can spend that energy on growth. And it's actually been able to show that where fish have those more robust SAV beds, you have larger fish. And someone like me who likes to fish, there's only so far out I can hold that fish before it doesn't look big anymore. So in a place like Michigan, we have a very robust fisheries. So if our fish start shrinking, that's going to drive down our tourism and the dollars that we get from that, so that can impact our economy. Uh, another issue with mute swans is thought that they stay in Michigan all year long. They don't have a traditional north-south migration like many other birds. There's nothing that's substantiated this yet, so uh, I know there's some scientists at Michigan State that are looking into some of the movements of mute swans, but uh, nothing's been released yet into uh, where they're at. And so that can actually prolong that impact of mute swans. Uh, this is a mute swan out in one of these uh, coastal wetland areas. And as you can see, this is middle of winter and that area is still open, so they're still able to have access to um, the food out there. And if any of you know anything about SAV, you might think, well, it's a plant, doesn't it snap or die off in the winter? And it does, but what's thought is that mute swans eat on the tubers of the root system of the SAV. So they're still impacting those SAV beds. So they're feeding on those tubers, and then when it comes time for them to be veg back out in that spring or summer, the SAV has nothing to veg out from. And so that SAV bed can be completely destroyed. Uh, and then also, too, the other issue with um, those mute swans coming out, um, it's thought that while they stay on those coastal wetlands, the mute swan populations that are on those inland lakes, so those inland lakes will freeze over, and it's thought that they migrate out laterally to those coastal wetland areas. So not only are you having those impacts of invasive species during the summer, spring, and fall, but during the winter, when those other lakes are freezing over, you have mute swans that are coming from those inland lakes and then impacting those coastal wetland lakes, even double, triple, depending on how many are moving back out there. So those coastal wetland lakes are getting hit even harder than our inland uh, wetlands are. So I did an initial survey of the uh, 21 Drowned River Mouth Lake along the uh, coastline of Lake Michigan. And for those of you who don't know what a Drowned River Mouth Lake is, it's an example of Bassey Lake, which is our furthest north lake we uh, looked at. So a uh, Drowned River Mouth Lake, you have a river that's coming into, for instance, Lake Michigan. And then right at the mouth of the lake, it gets blocked up. Uh, usually in this instance, it's going to be by sand. We have a lot of really big, huge sand dunes along Lake Michigan, so it blocks up that river, and then you have this uh, lake behind that, and so it's a drowned river mouth lake. So it makes sense when you think about it, but uh, most people don't understand right away. And they can be quite variable size. I would say Bessie Lake is a mid-sized lake. It's probably about a mile long to where something like White Lake or Rustine Lake, which are some of my study sites, those are several miles long and quite large of a lake. And just a little side note, during all of my surveys and all of my sampling when I was out in the field, I never once saw the uh, native trumpeter swan, which was kind of disappointing when you have a threatened species and you never see it. We were hoping maybe we could actually see that out there and maybe potentially do some sort of uh, behavioral analysis to see how they're interacting with the mute swans, but we never saw any of them at all. So we did some simple population count 
And this is just an example of uh, one of the plots that we saw out here on the Canadian Lake. And so those non-green plots were kind of green. You can have almost 100 individuals on these lakes of those uh, non-green adults. So after we did these surveys to just find out where the mute swans were, we wanted to do uh, further sampling. So we wanted to sample the vegetation, we wanted to sample the fish, uh, we also were doing invert sampling and also abiotics. And I'll maybe talk about the um, vegetation, fish, and abiotics uh, today. And so we selected four lakes because there was no way that we were going to get through all 21 of those lakes to do sampling. And we based that uh, lake selection off of the swamp population. We wanted two lakes that had really high populations and two lakes that had either zero or uh, no populations at all. So, or really low populations. And then we also based it on location too. We wanted um, those locations to be fairly close together because the range of uh, latitudes with uh, where those lakes were, if we had uh, two lakes that were really far north compared to really far south, the climate patterns that go through would be quite different and cause some uh, noise in our data that way that we didn't want. So our two high density swan lakes were the Mosquito Lake and the White Lake. And our two low density swan lakes were Motor Lake and Pigeon Lake. Uh, Motor Lake had just one family of swans on there, and Pigeon Lake didn't have anything until we were actually going off the lake for the final time. We were all done surveying and sampling, we were never going to go back there as we're pulling the boat off. We actually had a young new swan flying in for the very first time, so we think we actually saw a population establishing itself on that lake. So, and I was cursing at it too. <coughs> you ruined my study because you flew it. <laughs> Um, so then we identified where all the SAV beds were in each of these lakes, and then we drew a transect randomly uh, through these beds, so from the shoreline out to the edge of the uh, SAV bed. And then we would uh, uh, sample at three locations along that uh, transect. <coughs> we, are, we sample um, at a shallow depth, which was 0 0.5 to 0 0.74 meters. Uh, mid was 0.5 to 0.99 meters, and then deep was anything a meter above. And this uh, goes along with the fact that these swans are tip up feeders. They don't um, dive down to get their food, and about the furthest they can reach is about a meter or three feet uh, down. And this also corresponded with the uh, depths that Tattoo had all used in their study down the Chesapeake. So at each one of those locations, we released a throw trap, and so we would toss this off the boat, and it allowed us to be able to collect everything that was in that particular water column. And the throw trap had a meter square base. Uh, once we had that throw trap installed, we would measure the percent cover, and then also the uh, plant type of the SAV there. We would then break out all the SAVs, and if you guys want a really good shoulder and arm workout, I highly suggest you go break at the It will get you ready for tank top season like none other. So <laughs> it, you will be aching afterwards. It's a really good workout. Um, so we would uh, take the SAV, we would freeze it and take it back to the lab. And then once we're at the lab, we would thaw it and then uh, identify it down to species if we were able to. And then we would uh, put it in a drying oven in a dry weight of the SAV. We also would stain for fish in um, that water column. So in that throw trap, we would stain for fish. And we would uh, pull them out, identify them, and then uh, get total body length of the fish. And then we also sample for abiotics, so things like pH, dissolved oxygen, and uh, turbidity at each one of these SAV uh, locations. So to get into some of our results, so our sites that had uh, no swans versus our sites that had swans, uh, we didn't see a difference at all. So the percent cover, so the, the coverage of the sediment of SAV bed, we didn't see a difference. We did see a drop in plant height. So where there were swans, the plants were shorter. And then the dry weight, there was also less mass of SAV where there were And then we noticed from year one to year two on Muskegon Lake that we had an increase in mute swans. And so we're figuring, oh, if we have an increase in mute swans, in theory, we should see a drop in all of our uh, SAV uh, parameters. And just a little side note here, we did see a drop in the signet population, and that was because the management action was happening on those eggs and nests there at Muskegon. So with that increase in mute swans, we did see a drop in the percent cover. So with there being more mute swans, there was less.
less SAV covering that uh, wetland. And then there also was a drop in the plant height too, so less SAV um, there. And then the dry weight, we didn't see a drop, but if you look really closely with our 2012 data, there's a lot of variability there, and we think that's what caused uh, that issue with the fact that there wasn't a difference statistically there. But visually, it does look like there was a difference, but statistically, because of that variability, there wasn't. Uh, with our fish data, we saw uh, several species of fish. Our most numerous was the bluegill, and we did see the invasive uh, round goby at all of our lakes, which makes sense. Round goby are very common in the Great Lakes area, and since all of our Ground River Mouth lakes have direct access, usually via these channels out to Lake Michigan, it makes sense that you're going to have round goby going into these Ground River Mouth lakes. So we did a correspondence analysis of the fish count data, so we wanted to see what the count variability was from site to site. And so places where there were no mute swans, all of those sites were fairly similar in their count. Places where um, there were mute swans, I think I said that right, places where there aren't mute swans, they're, they're all fairly similar. Places where there are mute swans, uh, the counts were just all over the place. So there was a lot of variability between the counts at each of those sites. And then we also wanted to see if there was a difference in the bluegill sizes because bluegill was our most numerous fish and so we used that uh, for this analysis, because if you remember me talking about earlier, where those SAV beds are really robust, you usually tend to see bigger fish compared to sites where the SAV might not be as robust, so you should see smaller fish. With our fish, we did not see a difference in size at all, and I'll talk about some of the reasons behind that later. And then with all of our ABI data, I'm just going to talk about the things that we saw differences with. Uh, there was a drop in dissolved oxygen where there were new swans. Uh, there also was a drop in turbidity where there were mute swans, which actually was surprising, and I'll talk about that in the conclusion as to why. And then if you look at the redox potential, while overall there wasn't a difference, if you break it down year by year, <coughs> there was a difference. And that was because the numbers uh, flip-flopped from year one to year two of when we were collecting that data. And then we also wanted to plot these out to see, you know, were they separating along that mute swan uh, variable? And there just was a lot of overlap from our uh, sites that didn't have swans to our sites that did have swans. We then also tried to separate this to see, okay, are the different lakes separating out? And so Mona Lake separated out from White Lake. It also separated out from Pigeon Lake. But as you can see here on the ski and, or excuse me, uh, Pigeon Lake and White Lake are really overlapped. <coughs> and we'll all lay them all together. You can see that Mosquito Lake just overlaps everything. So we really weren't able to completely tease out those lakes from each other. So to kind of go back over um, everything, the percent cover, we didn't see an impact of the meat swans there. Uh, we did see an impact in the plant height, which makes sense if they're there and they're chowing down. They're chowing down enough that you're seeing a difference in the height, but maybe not where they're completely ripping out or eating all of that SAV, so you're not seeing those big empty spots on the, the lawn of SAV. And then they also impacted the dry weight. And we kind of used the dry weight because we didn't do um, the uh, shoot density because of the way we sampled. And so this was kind of our way of trying to figure out is that shoot, shoot density um, impacted have like our fast way of trying to do that because we didn't actually count the shoots while we're out there. And then the seeing lake, if you remember me saying that there was an increase in mute swans from year one to year two, that we did see that drop in percent cover, which makes sense if there's more mute swans, there's some more spots that they're completely clearing out and emptying up as they be. And it also makes sense that that uh, plant height is dropping as well because there's more of them there feeding on it. So it does have a chance to grow and then also that dry weight, we didn't see a difference, but if you remember me saying that large variability in that uh, year one data is probably what was causing that, so. And then with the uh, fish, there was a lot of variability in that data from, uh, so where we were seeing mute swans, there was just these large differences in the count 
which makes sense. Some of those spots, the activity isn't quite as robust, and so you should see less fish there. So that totally makes sense. Uh, with the size, we weren't seeing a difference, and I think this probably was because of our sampling effort. We were out there just kind of looking ecologically at things. We weren't really trying to hit one particular area of the study super hard. I think if you actually get a fisheries biologist to go out there and sample just for the fish in these areas, they might actually be able to tease apart if there is a difference in the sizes where these ponds are or where they aren't. Um, our sampling <coughs> numbers were so low, I don't feel like we can conclusively say that there isn't a difference. So. And then with the abiotics, yes and no, there was some differences with that dissolved oxygen. There was a drop in dissolved oxygen where there was one that makes sense. There's less plants there creating oxygen, and so it makes sense that there's going to be less dissolved oxygen in those spots where there's less plants. Um, with the turbidity, you would think that where there is SAB, when that uh, suspended particle hits the SAB, in theory, it should drop, so that turbidity should drop where there's SAB. It didn't. It was the complete opposite. And we think the reason behind that is the human impact around these lakes. All of these lakes have a lot of people living around them. There's also industry around them. Two of the lakes at the time had um, coal fire or power plants on there. So I think there was just a lot of noise in that data because of that anthropogenic impact on these lakes. And then some future analyses that we want to look at is to break it down by SAB species. We were just looking at the overall SAB mass. We want to see are there some differences in that SAB uh, community from spots where there are new swans to spots where there aren't new swans? Are they changing? Are they feeding on something, clearing out uh, a native species and allowing an invasive species to come in? So this is things that we might want to look at. Um, with our study, uh, I think to be able to really uh, do that really well, you're going to have to go out and live sample these plants. The way we did it, we rose our plants and brought them back to the lab. It's easy enough to be able to tell apart something like a uh, gill rack versus a milk foil. Uh, that's, I mean, with our, the way we did our study, that's easy to tease apart. But if you're looking at um, frozen milk foil, it's harder to be able to tell it apart, you know, from an invasive milk foil to a native milk foil. And so that's where if you want to get down to that level of analysis, um, you're going to have to have someone, a botanist, actually go out and sample We froze our SAB just because the the time that we had. We were only had a, a small window to be out sampling. So we could have been out there for months or weeks sampling live, then we could have done this process, but because of the time constraints, we weren't able to do that. We also want to look at the density dependence of swans. We did it the number of swans per lake. Um, something that uh, we might want to look at in the future is the number of swans per SAB bed. You have some of these SAB beds where they might just have a family of swans. You have two adults and four cygnets on this smaller SAB bed, but maybe on the larger SAB bed you have this huge non-spacing flock. And so maybe we should look at the number of swans per the area of the uh, SAB bed. That might be a better way to uh, look at those impacts. And then something else too is uh, doing uh, some remote sensing on these beds. All the uh, methods that we use and previous people have used are just these little bits and pieces. So some people have looked at uh, the diet analysis or the gut content of new swans to see what they're eating. Um, other folks like tattoo and all they use exposures throughout the SAB bed. We just use those quadrats along those transects to see what was in that. But no one's really looked overall to be able to see is that SAB bed so if we look at it year one, and we see an increase in new swans, is that SAB bed shrinking down the overall bed? Or as maybe management controls are happening, all those swans, are we seeing that increase in the SAB bed? Or if the population gets completely out of control, does that SAB bed completely disappear? And so this is where something like remote sensing can help out with that versus just doing those little, like, this test here and test here. Remote sensing allows you to be able to look at those as a whole thing. And so we wanted to see, was this actually something that we could do? So we decided to do a test run on the Seagate Lake to see uh, what sort of uh, results can we get by using remote sensing. 
And so we use uh, satellite data, uh, the Landsat 875 um, uh, imagery, and just to let you know that all of that has a 30 middle meter pixel size, so it's a very large uh, pixel size when it comes to that. And then we use uh, Landsat uh, band three through five on uh, the eight imagery, and then two through four on the seven and five imagery. And these corresponded with a study that was done down in South America looking at the U-beds of the swan uh, down there. And this imagery was collected in 1984, 2000, and 2013. It was all collected in September. We chose September because that's when I was out doing my sampling, uh, uh, the SAB beds. And September is usually where you see that most pronounced impact of where we swans have been feeding all year. And I have to that in theory should be at its smallest at that point in time so you can see that the largest impact. We did all the processing in MD Classic. We pre-processed everything with the Landsat calibration tool. So when you have these different images, you want to be able to get them all to line up and be as similar to each other. So that any like things besides that raw data that you're looking at isn't uh, uh, impacting your results. So we corrected all of those images to the 2013 uh, master image. Uh, we did an automatic image image registration and then pairs of line registration. So when you're looking at satellite imagery, it's it's going through the atmosphere and depending on how much cloud cover and stuff, it can alter that image so slightly. So this is to correct that to make that all um, in line with each other. And then we did spatial subsets of these images. So some of these images were quite large. So we uh, just did the subset of where there are uh, 1,000 uh, by 1,000 pixels. And then we did a user-defined spectral imaging. And from that, we selected our regions of interest. So we were just looking at deep water and vegetation. That was all we really cared about. Can we find <coughs> that vegetation within that water? And then we created a height, uh, map to highlight that vegetation. So with all that jargon, this is what we got. So anywhere where it's white, that is the vegetation. Anywhere where it's uh, black on the image, that it should be uh, the water. And unfortunately, with our uh, three sets of images, the only one that we actually were able to detect any possible uh, SAB vegetation was in the uh, year 2000. <coughs> and I know it's gonna be very, very hard to see for uh, most people, but even on my computer, it still is hard. But if you look very carefully, you can see these little small white splotches all around, and that's where we were actually able to detect SAB out in these lakes. So not as great as what we want it to be, but you could actually see it there. And if you go back and look at where the SAB beds are in the Seeking Lake, where we knew where they were, it all pretty much lines up with where we knew those SAB beds should be. And so how can we improve on this process? Well, let's use drones. I mean, that solves everything. Right, we all like drones, it's the biggest thing now. But um, also in, um, not only are they called drones, but uh, well, uh, they're also known as unmanned area vehicles. So that's uh, where it's just the actual vehicle itself flying around. The more technical term is unmanned aerial systems. So that's where it really is a truly automated um, vehicle that is flying around where you pre-program it and it will fly itself. So you're not actually literally having yourself. If you look really carefully here with the vehicle, you're still having someone that is actually controlling it by hand with the UAS system. That is where you have uh, people uh, programming it and you set the flight pattern and then it will go and fly itself. And so these kind of systems are really good because it will give us the image resolution that we need. Remember that Landsat data was 30 meter pixels with um, UAPs. You can get down to a centimeter uh, pixel size. And it'll allow you to actually go through, I don't know how well you'll be able to make out the black and white image here of the um, alligator, but they actually are <coughs> able to measure alligators down to within a centimeter and get it accurate by that. Uh, this was a study done by uh, some folks down at the University of Florida, and they are able to really get some amazing imagery to be able to be able to tell this. And why is that important with these SAB beds? Well, the study that was done down in South America, the SAB beds that they were dealing with were 10 times the size of the SAB beds that we were dealing with in our study area. And so while they might still be able to pick out those SAB beds and be able to see them shrink and grow, we need 
see like what we could see. And so all these following images are for us to be like just pulled right off the internet just to see what it is we can see. And if you look really carefully, you can see all these nice little white blotches in there. Those are all mute spawns. Um, and you can do a little bit more. You can go through and count all of these different mute swans, and there are a ton of them there. And so it allows you a way that you can do population counts. When we went out and did our population counts, we're in a boat, driving, motoring around this lake, and it takes a couple hours on some of these bigger lakes to get all the way around. With the UAV, you can really cut that down. Uh, the also nice thing too is you have this record here. So not only am I able to count it, but I can send it off to four other people in this room and you can go through and count it. And then you also have this historical data too if someone further down the road wants to look and verify. Like, I don't know if they really saw a swan. Well, here you have to prove that you actually did see a swan. And you're also gonna be more accurate with your counts too, because if you're in a boat with binoculars trying to count swans, a little difficult. I mean, you'll be getting multiple different counts from different people all the time, especially when you're dealing with hundreds of swans. And so here you can actually take your time to count the swans, and so your, your accuracy is going to be a little bit better. Um, we're also able to identify where the nests are. This is, like I said, uh, still on the Stephen Lake. This is where I know nest is, and we can actually see it um, through this imagery. And then you can also uh, assess the population structure of the swan. We could make out the difference between the adult swan and the cygnus um, on these imagery. So imagine how much better this would be with a UAS system of where you're seeing that fine resolution, how well you could really make it out. Because even on this, we could see that some of our swans still had their immature plumage, and then uh, some of those cygnus were already starting to develop their adult plumage. And so you can kind of see as that. Uh, Signet <coughs> growing through the years to see how they're transitioning from young to old, and you can assess things that way. And we actually, you know, did see this particular family out on that lake. And, you know, it's you always want to be able to verify your data is, um, when you're doing this, and so you need to do that ground truth to make sure that what you're seeing on the imagery is what you're seeing out in real life. Um, some other issues uh, is. <coughs> So we talked about the impacts that mute swans have and how we can you know, find better ways to study them. So what are agencies doing right now to manage uh, mute swans? So that's a really important thing. Like what do we do to get this population driven down? Because it's an invasive species. We really don't want it around very long. It's not doing, as you can see, it's having an impact on the environment. So there's two big things that they do. Egg addling, so they go out and shake the eggs to uh, destroy that um, embryo. Uh, they all also do nest destruction as well. And so issue with egg addling, mute swans live a really long time, and so you're constantly having to do this year after year. You have to have all this manpower all the time to go out, find these nests, destroy these eggs. And so that's a lot of management and money that maybe agencies don't have. And so a number of agencies have resulted in having to cull their mute swans. And so for a place like Michigan, this is um, happening <coughs> because we have so many mute swans. It's the most effective way. You don't have to keep going out to manage that population because if you uh, remove that entire population from the lake, you don't have to go back out again to uh, manage that population because it's no longer there. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot of time. It doesn't take as long. So for a lot of agencies, it's their preferred method to manage, which also is very controversial. I mean, mute swans are a very beautiful bird. People don't like to see them destroyed, and I'm completely sympathetic to that plight. But I also understand the agency needing to find better ways to manage uh, their resources. And so, like I said, usual, our agencies will go out and do culling of swans on Hamlin Lake, where I had one of those really large non breeding flocks. Uh, they were there year one. Year two, I went out there, the whole flock was gone, and I found out two days before that, that uh, one of the state agencies, the federal agency, had gone through and removed all of those swans via culling. So um, another possibility, rather than having agencies have to go through and do the culling, I don't know how many of you, have you guys heard of the uh, Florida python hunts? Oh, yeah, it's, it's really popular. People seem to really like it. Um, there's <coughs> multiple benefits to it. Uh, one, you have people incurring the cost of going out and doing the hunting. The agency isn't having to incur the cost of having to go out and do the polling themselves. Two, you're also having that uh, the public become more well informed. I've 
most people in Florida now know what a python is. They know that it's an invasive species. If you do something like that with mute swans in the Great Lakes area, then you might be able to help the public understand why it is that we have to uh, for, uh, do management on these species. And communication is a really big key because people won't understand the fact that, say, in Michigan, where we've actually been doing culling and a lot of management, we've been able to reduce that mute swan population by a third to almost half, uh, depending on what current numbers you're looking at. And so it helps people understand why that's important. They're going to have to go out and talk to them. And this is where I'm going to go stand on my little side comms platform here for a little bit to say why it's so important. Um, because if you are on the internet and you look up Deep Swan, you're going to see a lot of backlash of people wanting to save their swans. Because either one, they don't understand it's invasive, or two, because it's a beautiful species and they just don't want to see any control of it. I can sympathize with that, but like we were talking about earlier, with time and money, it's difficult to be able to just do the egg at least. You will have to also do culling as well. And so by going out and informing the public as to the issues with new swans, you can help them to understand why agencies are happy to do that. And this is where communication comes in. It's really great to go out and do all these kind of talks just like we're doing right now, but I'm talking to other scientists. You need to actually go out <coughs> and hit the public. And a really good way to do that is with science communication via social media. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Periscope, like we're doing right now, is a good way to hit the public where they're at. And so that way you can talk to them about whatever species it is you're working with and help them to understand the issues behind it. And that also needs to be supplemented though. As much as I love social media, I love to be on my phone to be able to communicate with people, you also need to make sure that you're going out and talking to people face to face. So getting uh, more of that uh, information out to people when they're out in these parks and areas. Uh, a number of places where you go to, you'll see um, signs up for invasive species coming out. I'm sure if you guys go to the lake, you'll see something about zebra quagga mussels there. You also need to make sure you have the signage up for swans as well to inform people that are invasive species and why they're invasive and what to be on the lookout for and then where to report them so if it's a new population popping up. So with that, uh, here's all of my uh, mini references. Uh, it's a zillion thank yous that I have to everyone who helped out with the project in some way. And I'll take uh, any questions you have. Not as clear enough to be able to tell is it a native or a um, invasive. 
questions? Okay, let's thank Nicole one more time.